Hello, Guardians, and welcome to episode 99 of Podcast vs. Enemies, a Destiny Massive Breakdown show. We have an exciting episode today as we are joined by Chris Proctor to talk about the Into the Light weapon stream and recent blog post that went up. We are just as excited as you are to get into it, so we'll keep the intro brief. Court, who are we thanking this week? Hello, Sane. Impetus, hope you guys are well. Yep, as usual, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Ascii and Monk, I am K Rose, and this moment, of course, our lovely patrons, and you, the listeners. You can send us all kinds of feedback directly to any of our socials or via the Destiny Massive Breakdowns Discord server. Positive, critical and constructive feedback helps with the trajectory of the podcast and how we present and break down builds, activities and much more in the PvE sandbox for all kinds of Destiny players. We also want to extend a special thanks and appreciation to everyone that supports PvE, whether that is downloading and listening to our show, discussing it on social media and our Discord server, or supporting us via Patreon. Speaking of Patreon, if you'd like to support the show, please visit destinymassivebreakdowns.com and click on the link to Patreon. You'll get access to members-only channels in Discord, behind-the-scenes content like episode previews, including this particular episode, and provide input on the future of the show. All right, Impetus, what are we covering today? We are covering one thing and one thing only, a developer Q&A with Chris Proctor on the Into the Light weapons. As an FYI, our last Bungie developer episode was back in May 2023 with Chris Proctor and Rodney Thompson. That was episode 63, where we discussed weapons, armor, and armor charges. Before that, we had another interview that was in November 2022 with Chris Proctor and Vivian Bex of the weapons team. That was episode 38. As a reminder, this is a PvE podcast, so please expect this to be focused on PvE. We also signed an NDA and were given the opportunity to read the Into the Light Weapon Insights blog. It's published the 27th of March, 2024, a few days early. We'll be expanding on what was seen in the second Into the Light live stream, as well as that Insights blog post with additional questions from the three hosts here. As a reminder, Chris Proctor is joining us as a weapons developer, uh, so we can expect topics including traits, origin traits, weapon systems, exotic weapons, etc. You will not find any questions or answers related to other areas of the game like abilities or combat, armor, raids and dungeons, narrative, general economy, or materials in this episode. If you would like to hear from developers from those and other areas of Destiny, then please do let Bungie know. Finally, there will be a transcript posted over on the DMB website, and Court will be posting an abridged summary breakdown over on Reddit. All right, Saint, let's get into the meat of the bones. Who are we talking with today? Chris is a returning guest of the show and has been on PvE and a few other Destiny podcasts over the last few years. For the benefit of those who are brand new to Destiny or this podcast or maybe didn't catch yesterday's live stream, what do you do at Bungie and what have you worked on recently? Uh, yeah, so I joined Bungie in uh, late 2019. So I've, I've been here for four and a half years, give or take. I shipped a, a whole bunch of Destiny weapons releases as the weapons feature lead. Very cool. And we heard that you recently got a promotion within Bungie. Can you tell us anything about that? Uh, yeah, I'm moving into the combat area design lead role. Uh, which is sort of one step uh, up the Destiny organization diagonally, uh, where the combat area includes uh, combatants and bosses and abilities. So I'll be helping uh, kind of guide and unblock uh, like core combat gameplay kind of stuff. And I'm leaving the weapons team in super capable hands. We've got like a pretty decently staffed weapons team now, five designers or something, um, and like, all of them have shipped a bunch of amazing weapons and really know their, their way around the sandbox. So uh, they're going to get the chance to take the lead on this stuff. Yeah, you guys have been nothing if not prolific recently with all of the mid-season weapons, all the into light stuff, and then I'm sure a bunch of more stuff that we're going to see soon in the final shape. Um, on the live stream today, we're going to we're going to jump into some questions, kind of you know focus a lot about into the light here. Um, some of the weapons had these column three and four traits, um, and the live stream also stated that they could potentially drop multiple column three and four traits. Um, so 
how many traits can you get? Uh, is this like a playlist weapons thing where you can earn more over time? Um, and is it always attached to the kind of unique variants of these weapons? Uh, yeah, so you hit the nail on the head with the last comment there. It is the limited edition variants that drop with the like super shiny limited edition ornaments, which get the double traits um columns three and four uh the regular drops don't get that and it's not not a playlisty kind of thing uh but since there are like a smaller number of perks and you can uh, focus farm them pretty easily through attunement uh you don't really feel the lack i think is there any kind of special acquisition path for some of these weapons considering their strength of their roles or will they all be available on a rotation you know kind of kind of like nightfall loot rotates through via onslaught uh yeah so <clears throat> excuse me so yeah six of the weapons uh will either be in the default pool unlocked or available for unlock uh week one and then one a week will unlock after that uh, leading up to final shape um and you can just attune whatever weapons you've unlocked uh that you've done that quest for um at any point so it's it sort of ends up feeling a bit like the the nightfall rotation except that players get to choose uh what weapons are going to drop I think it's a 50% chance of dropping the thing you're attuned to for each drop of uh, an into the light weapon. Yeah, it's pretty huge. I mean, I think, you know, you've had a, some various ways of focusing loot and, and stuff like that, but target farming is something that we haven't seen in a long time. And I, I, I know a lot of players are um, excited about that and kind of that having a little bit more agency over, you know, their, their loot drops and things like that. Um, will clearing higher you know, sets or, or playing on the higher tier difficulties of Onslaught have any change to your chances of getting these these shiny weapons to drop? Uh, you know, I know that there's like a playlist, you know, we've got a normal and then there's a higher like legend difficulty tier, right? It just increases the number of chests. Uh, so like the, the deep you get into the activity uh, and like there are other conditions that you can uh, unlock, you just get an extra chest. Uh, and so you get more chances at the foil, but it's not a higher chance per drop. It's the, the same chance. Okay. And, and just to clarify, it's it's just two traits in column three and four that you can get at max. Ah, uh, yeah, and that's just on the um, the limited edition variants. Right. Yeah, but it's always two if you get one of those. So when we say limited, are, is this thing going to be as rare as a, you know, shiny Dragonite, so to say, back in the day? Uh, really, <laughs> really low chances or maybe uh kind of more of like a one in a hundred type of scenario uh they're not that rare like it's not um okay. shiny pokemon level rare okay uh, you, you could reasonably <laughs> expect to uh get a handful of these uh as you're you're playing it's not really going to be possible to super target farm them so like if you wanted to get a specific role on uh a specific limited edition variant um yeah i, I wouldn't i wouldn't go out aiming to do that put it that way <laughs> All right, well, speaking of some shiny stuff, uh, we're going to talk about enhanceable perks, uh, not just for these weapons. Obviously, uh, you guys have revealed uh, recently that uh, uh, prophecy weapons, some of the new uh, uh, playlist weapons are getting enhanceable in the final shape. So we've got a few questions related to that. Um, so for these non-raid weapons... Barrels, magazines, and masterwork. Will those be affected by? Uh, will you be able to enhance these or uh, or change them? I should say. Uh, no, the reason why we did that for the raid weapons is that when the base weapons for a set are craftable, uh, the adepts aren't, and so it makes it too hard for the adept weapons to compete. If you can freely select mm. barrel and magazine uh, for the the craftable weapons, and you can't for the the adept. So yeah. The, the bar that we're going to use is if the base set is craftable, the adept weapons can pick barrel and magazine. Currently, that's only for raid weapons, so it does not apply here. Um, so the Into the Light weapons and the other uh, 735 weapons will be uh, like enhanced um, trade zero, trade one only. Uh, next up, what will the materials cost for enhancing traits look like? Uh, that, I believe, is going to be pretty similar to raid weapons. Um, I don't have the, the numbers to hand. And I think uh, a lot of folks have been wondering. Um, I know today I looked at some uh, some questions. Uh, will you be able to enhance multiple 
traits. So, for example, we're going to have some of these special into the light weapons. You'll have two traits in column three and four. Can you enhance both of those, all four of those traits? Uh, yes, you can. If you've got multiple perks per column, you can enhance all of them. This is like a part of the tech that we're waiting for to roll out enhancement more broadly. Very cool. Yeah. I knew the the spacing on that new weapons <laughs> build screen was a little <laughs> suspicious, you know? That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, one of the things that is interesting with these older weapons coming back is, are they going to be keeping the stat packages that they had? Because that that is sort of shifted over time, of course. Um, so what, if any, are the stat changes for the end of the light weapons? Uh, yeah, so we only ended up having to change these stats for three of them. Uh, like armory weapons have just ridiculously juiced stats, so we didn't do any of those. But uh, increased Luna's Howl's handling by 10, Recluse's range by 6. Uh, Vindike Ku got a bit of a more substantial change, so plus 10 range, plus 5 stability, plus 14 airborne effectiveness. Uh, and otherwise it's unchanged. Um yeah, yeah, just those three. Uh, also, yeah, every weapon in the release that it's uh, valid for has uh, deterministic recoil. And those are kind of hand-picked in a uh, fairly deliberate way. And so just to confirm, Blast Furnace is getting the Rasmussen ISA scope by <coughs> default now, and it will have barrels in column one, but the plus two range and the plus 13 handling that normally came with that scope is not going to be incorporated into the base stats of this Brave version, Correct. Right, yeah. So you'll get the the nice clean sites uh, that come with uh, Rasmussen ISA, and uh, you can easily get those stats in in the form of barrels, like you um, put fluted barrel on if you want the high handling or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, barrels typically have like a higher stat bonuses anyway, so it's a pretty good trade off. All right, so let's talk a little bit. Uh, we get some new traits. You know, we got a new origin trait for these weapons, indomitability, and that. That appears to be a, a pretty powerful trait. Um, you know, kind of what was your design idea for this? And and if we can get any kind of specific numbers on uh, ability percentages, that would be huge. But I, I know that may be asking a lot. Sure. So uh, Destiny 2 Into the Light is like all about like light and darkness, right? So we wanted to have uh, an origin trait that could reflect that like duality, like a guardian's duality. Mm -hmm. uh, so we wanted to do something that would tie into your abilities and tie into light and darkness. So I opted for the design where um, uh, when you're a, a light subclass, weapon kills grant you grenade energy. When you're a darkness subclass, uh, weapon kills grant you melee energy. Uh, this is uh, same sort of scale as classic contender. So like, uh, which I believe is 2.5%. Um, for comparison, I think Demolitionist and um, uh, Pugilist on a primary weapon, I think a 5%? It's either 5 or 10. That's all right, I don't, don't have the numbers to hand. But anyway, it's, it's roughly, roughly half standard Demolitionist. Okay. And I believe this, there is a weapon in this set that can roll with Demolitionist as well. Some some potential cooking there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like light subclass with demolitionist. Uh, yeah, you'll be like cranking through the grenade energy. Oh, would you look at that? For Baron's gets demo in the third column. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness, man. That and, gun's and trash, a... dude. It needs it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a friend commented earlier today after seeing the stream that it's uh, ironic that the thing to finally power creep for Baron's was for Baron's. <laughs> <laughs> So we have another question about the new perk, uh, which is called Desperate Measures, although on the live stream it was called Last Stand. Um, so uh, I think you guys kind of answered a lot of the questions related to this, and there was a lot of kind of comments about its similarity to Golden Tricorn. Uh, do you want to kind of expand on that more here? Uh, yeah, and thanks for uh, noting the actual name of the thing, because I... Could not get that uh, to pop up in my memory this morning. But uh, yeah, so Last Stand was the dev name for Destiny 2 Into the Light, which is why hmm. we, that's hmm. why that was the, the dev name. But it's the name of um, 
uh, the exotic trait on um, Vigilance Wing. So we, we had to switch it to something else. And Desperate Measures, like, hit the same note that we wanted to. Um, but yeah, anyway, so it grants 10% uh, damage on a weapon kill, 20% uh, on a grenade or melee kill, and that can stack once. So you can uh, get to, like, if you get a melee kill and then a grenade kill, you could get 30% damage. Um, I know there was some comparison to Golden Tricorn, and Golden Tricorn requires it to be matched damage, and this doesn't. So that's the big differentiator. This is, like, easier to get up and rolling across a variety of builds, and it's uh, easier to sustain. It lasts for seven seconds and can be refreshed. And will this also roll as an enhanced version? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so you'll be able to enhance that uh, once the final shape ships. Cool. All right, let's let's uh, let's get to the big three here and talk about the process of bringing back Mountaintop, Recluse, Luna's Howl, specifically the perks that are so strongly associated with those three. Um, let's start with Mountaintop and, of course, the, the micro-missile frame as it is now. What was the process of recreating the intrinsic trait of micro-missile and how has it been designed to keep its original feel without being... Um, a menace, I think, is actually kind of saying it lightly, the the <laughs> terror that it was in PvP. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if you remember, um, like, around the time Beyond Light came out, um, yeah, Mountaintop was a huge menace. And even though, uh, like, it was about to be unusable in high-end PvE, it was going to, like, still be valid in PvP. So we had to nerf it, even though people were already kind of moving away from it. Um so we didn't want to go back to being able to easily one hit, um, one hit kill guardians from any distance in PvP. So it just can't one hit anymore. That's that's the major change there. But as a result, we were able to like remove all of the penalties that it had. Like uh, I just remember, it was like super inaccurate from the air after we nerfed it that time. So that's gone. Um, and it also uh, can now be used as kind of a rocket jumping tool so it does like a tiny amount of self damage and can really launch you into the air uh which is like great for repositioning quickly in in pvp i'm sure we'll see some montages there or like you can like transition into an airborne play style or something like that uh we're also uh really cranking breach grenade launch impact damage so it's actually going to hit pretty hard like you will use bridge grenade launches in PvE for like crowd control or you would use waveframes or whatever, but like a standard breach GL is just not that useful for single target damage. So with this change, um like mountaintop will be pretty good again. Uh, double fire GLs, that kind of thing as well. So that impact change that's coming in PvE specifically, or is that gonna also apply in PvP but not enough to one shot with mountaintop specifically? Uh, yeah, so there's a, a bunch of scaling going on, but uh, we changed the baseline behavior and then detuned the PvP damage, which is kind okay. of the opposite of the way we normally do it. Uh, normally, mm -hmm. PvP is the true damage and we scale it for PvE. Um, yeah, as far as like why we rebuilt the trait as an intrinsic, uh, random rolling that trait on other grenade launchers would have been super weird. Um, and this gives us the opportunity to, in the future, if we want to release more... Um, like micro missile frame grenade launches, like we want to let a mountaintop stay and be special for a while, but like sometime in the future, um, I'd expect to see another one. Maybe we'll wait and see, like whether this breaks anything first. Yeah, that's smart. That's smart. Uh, speaking of things that break, uh, magnificent howl. That was a crazy good perk. <laughs> so uh, you've already explained a little bit on the live stream how that perk got reworked. The two tap is still there, but it does require investment from the player to get to the point where you can two tap in pvp how will those shots specifically play out though after the reload do they fire out one after another is there some sort of alternation or delay to that fire pattern uh yeah it fires out the same way that that it did and each shot um just does the increased damage and it's uh i don't think we mentioned this on the stream but it's actually a large amount of damage like you will be doing almost 120 damage per crit with the um the magnificent howl shots so you get two of those you are easily two tapping a guardian uh and if you like get a bunch of those queued up you do a huge amount of damage in pve as well so it's it's pretty high utility and there's no timer or anything either so i can kind of carry those around hmm oh no okay wow um 
And there are going to be enhanced versions of Magnificent Howl too, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there will be. I don't know that we've decided on an implementation for those. Um, I need to guess the numbers to hand, but it's I. I would be surprised if we do even more damage. Okay. <laughs> you know, well, know we'll this, is probably, uh, this is probably not the initial thought, but whenever I start hearing traits that I think have a lot of potential in PvP, my mind tends to take that and start to think, well, what about what about PvE? What if I'm clearing out some ads? You know, is has there you've, you've played test this at all, kind of like trying to clear out some ads and then reload to to burst down a major or something like that? You know, that sounds like there's some good potential there too. Yeah, particularly since hand cannons uh, do such high damage to um, to mages. Uh, yeah, it actually it works very well in PvE, in that kind of a role. And because it's still a precision frame hand cannon, even though it's just a different RPM, it will still share the PvE bonuses that 180 RP, or, sorry precision frame hand cannons have got. Is that correct, Chris? Uh, so it does get the um, like vertical recoil and the uh, massive bump to airborne effectiveness. Mm-hmm. that our precision hand cannons get so it will be a 140 with like very high ae if that's something that you care about okay that is really interesting i uh, couldn't help but notice you did name drop not forgotten uh in the article mm-hmm. letting us know that you did not forget about it uh is there anything else maybe you want to mention about the uh the other <laughs> hand cannon I uh, don't have anything specific, uh, but we really wanted to save Not Forgotten when there was a chance for us to ship it and in a way that would really make it shine and stand on its own rather than being a, a part of uh, like a larger set of weapons, which felt felt fine for Luna's Howl. Um, yeah, we didn't want it to be lost in the, the large set of weapons that we're shipping here. You touched on uh, the micro-missile frame, uh, mm-hmm. how you're wanting to keep that kind of unique to Mountaintop for now anyway is that going to be the same for master of arms and magnificent howl uh yeah we see these uh, perks as being kind of like uh when we first introduce a a new perk for a raid we like it to be exclusive to that weapon set for a little while um i would expect us to like leave it a couple of releases um so like sometime in the year following uh final shape you would see these start to pop up elsewhere but they like we've tested them locally, and like the, it's pretty fun running Master of Arms on a uh, like another arbitrary weapon type or um, a Magnificent Howl on like a, a 180 hand cannon or something like that. Yeah, that'd be gross. Goodness sakes. <laughs> yeah, man, that's uh, nasty. Before we get into the next question, you know, I wanted to ask: whenever you're going back and looking at at weapons like Luna's Howl and you know, like Mountaintop. Was there ever any thought of, should we just make it an exotic, you know, kind of going back to some really old D1 mentality of taking an elemental primary and then bringing it back in the cost of, of taking up your exotic slot? Uh, yeah, that comes up quite a lot. Like, it's it's something that is super frequently suggested on Reddit um, or whatever, right? The problem is that the performance is not exotic. Like, the they are exotic level strength. But they're not, like, you couldn't substitute that for, like, Dragon's Breath even or, um, Mm. you know, uh, whatever, Revision Zero or something. Like, these are, like, really special, feel really unique. And uh, we don't think that legendaries, even with a unique trait like this, uh, hit the exotic quality bar for, like, visuals or audio or game feel or anything. Um, So, yeah, like, we're more likely to do stuff like uh, more unique weapon subfamilies uh, and that kind of thing, that kind of functionality for legendaries, uh, then we are to convert a, like, spicy legendary into an exotic. Taking a look at some of the raid weapons, speaking of, of weapons that have grown over time, you know, is there any concern that the reprised versions of Forbearance and Secession undermine the originals, which are still obtainable, you know, and still require their respective expansions, but, you know, aren't getting their, their pools refreshed here? Uh, Yeah, this was like, we discussed this quite a lot, like, should we uh, make sure that they just have the exact same roles and decided, well, then no one's going to want the new ones at all, Um, so why bother doing that? Uh, Or should we update the, uh, like, Vow of the Disciple or Deepstone Crypt versions of these weapons? And, oh, people just went in and got those, like, we don't do that either. (laughs) Uh, But ultimately, we decided to update the perk pools on the Destiny 2 Into the Light versions 
uh, in a like relatively small way and otherwise lean on um, the origin traits to differentiate them. So the, uh, in the Destiny 2 Into the Light weapons all have like the uh, indomitability origin trait. They can't roll with Soul Drinker or Brain Inheritance. So that, that already differentiates them a bit. And for certain applications, Soul Drinker is super, super strong. So like there's still a place for um, Vow Forbearance. But yeah, we'll see how players take to them. I think the other thing is that this, some of these weapons are getting reasonably old, so I think it's okay if uh, people want to go into um, Onslaught to go and get the newer versions. Yeah, yeah, I guess well, Forbearance is like two years old at this point. So session's pushing three years old. Yeah, three Almost, years old. We yeah. did do a refresh um, more recently than that, but yeah, yeah. like by the time um, Destiny 2 Into the Light comes out... Uh, yeah, they'll be getting fairly old. It's time for a bit of a refresh. Be curious if uh, there's maybe like a small spike to Deepstone Crypt and uh, Vow the Disciple, because you know new players coming in or folks who haven't done those raids before. Now that uh, Fire Team Finder is a thing, uh, these these two weapons are like, oh, look at what you could get in these raids. Kind of a little kind of promotional material. Mm. That's what I've yeah, been I mean, thinking. Yeah, I mean that's. Uh... That's kind of the hope, uh, really. Yeah. Like, it uh, it gives a bit of that like raid weapon power to players who don't typically play raids, but hopefully also uh, encourages people to try out that content. Like, if you haven't played Valve the Disciple and you want to get more weapons that feel like forbearance, well, like that's an amazing raid. Like, uh, you would go in there, have a blast, get some great loot, and maybe uh, the new forbearance helped convince you to try it. You know, we were talking. We were talking yesterday about doing blind content and blind raids for the first time, and I don't think I've ever been more confused in my life than the opening, and not the opening, but the first encounter of Val the Disciple trying to read the images off the oh, totem. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that I was going to have to learn a whole new language to get through that, uh, which we did get through eventually, but man, hell of a time going through Val the Disciple for the very first time for anybody. <laughs> I loved that uh, we... Like every raid group came up with their own names for all of the symbols. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was great. Like to the point where we actually put names on the symbols in later content. Oh, so yeah. that uh, people could, if they wanted to, share the language and people still come up with their own names. It's great. Yeah. I want to say it was the, the man with a hole in his chest and everybody just kept saying bleach uh, <laughs> was like the joke for that one. Yeah. There's a lot of good ones out there. Well, next up we have a weapon which has returned the same amount of times that Tanix and Kelgraf has <laughs> returned. Uh, we have Hung Jury. Uh, it's the first time we've seen Kinetic Tremors in the third column, which seems really strong considering its fourth column options, as we see in the blog post article. Um, so this this question's from like the three of us. It just kind of reminds us of uh, like will will we see a kind of archetypal uh, differential um, change with these uh, with kinetic tremors? So any chance we'll see uh, based on RPM or mag percentage, similar to something like target lock? Uh, yeah, that's something that um, that is definitely on the table, and I, I can pass that feedback on to the weapons team. Uh, we have a, a bit of a problem in this regard in that, like, we can do tuning per weapon type, um, and we do that in a handful of cases, or we tune it based on magazine size. We can't easily combine those two, and we don't want to go and hand tune every possible combination of weapon type and subfamily, because that would be like 30 different custom tunings, even if we had the tech to do it, which we currently don't. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think like we could go uh, like look at that stuff and consider moving more of it over to percentage of mag uh, with like a little tuning on top of that for weapon archetype or something like that. Following up on hung jury, um, there is some controversy. Uh, some people wondering why uh, X weapon didn't make the cut. <laughs> You did mention that there's a, you know, you had a pretty large list at the start of this when you're deciding what's going to actually go into, uh, into the light. Um, can you give us, can you give us a selection of weapons that didn't quite meet the final cut for whatever reason? And then if you do or don't want to do that, what was the logic that you used to decide what did actually make the cut? Uh, sure. Yeah. So we had, um, like gathered suggestions inside the studio and like looked at, uh, like various player requests that we've gotten over the years. Um, we ended up with 40 weapons or so uh, that we really wanted to bring in. Um, and then we had to figure out how many we could actually reasonably make. 
and it ended up being 12, uh, which is a surprisingly small number. Like 12 is a large number of weapons, but when you're looking at uh, the kind of legacy that we've got here, uh, it was pretty tough. Yeah, I, I can drop some of the um, the weapons that we had to cut pretty painfully. <laughs> um, like Chroma Rush, like a super good auto mm. rifle. Uh, not quite, like it was very good, not quite iconic enough. Um, first in, last out. Like uh, that was actually one of the first weapons I, I worked on was the um, uh, Season of Arrivals version of that. So I was fond of that too. Uh, I think we would rather just ship another really good slug shotgun. Um, Dust Rock Blues, like similar thing, 21% Delirium, like we mm. felt like we would rather ship that as a Gambit playlist weapon uh, or maybe a Pursuit weapon sometime in the future rather than include it here. <laughs> Fate Bringer, like how many hand cannons can we put in this set? We decided two <laughs> is a good number um, and there were several that, that we wanted to put in, like Dire Promise would have been great, but... Dire Promise over Lunas Howl or Midnight Coup is a pretty tough ask. Um, Wastelander, Entire PD, um, like we will at some point probably ship that as a Hake Foundry, like World Pool weapon, um, much though like we have a lot of nostalgia for it. Uh, Trophy Hunter would have been great. Again, doesn't quite hit that level of, uh, of being iconic and meta. Um, hopefully we see that come back again as well. Um, yeah, Arantil. FR4, like, uh, super meta at, at one point. But, yeah, like, say, same sort of a deal with that. Yeah, so it was, it was a pretty hard choice. And particularly given that the cost to bring different weapons back varies depending on how old they are. Like, the older they are, the more expensive they are. Uh, so we opted to do 12 spread out across, um, like, a mixture of, uh, like, older and newer weapons. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious because... This is a very strange game in that you have many, many, many years worth of weapons to choose from. Uh, and we did actually see, in the case of Elsie's rifle, a gun, one of the oldest guns possible from, from Destiny as an entire franchise coming in. Was that weird to kind of take a gun that old and say, <laughs> hey, welcome to, uh, <laughs> welcome to End of the Light. Welcome to Destiny 2. We're going to give you an origin trait compared to all the original stats that... Uh, the stranger's rifle, as it was called back then, had. Yeah, that was a really interesting one. Uh, we were casting around for, like, we wanted to do one or two Destiny 1 weapons, and there were a few that we could have considered, right? Like, Hung Jury is one of them. Um, uh, we could also have done Fate Bringer or, like, any of the, like, D1 raid weapons, potentially. Uh, but we looked around for a weapon that we could reasonably easily bring forward because it does vary a lot. Like if you if we have the source art from Destiny One, it's it's not too bad. Uh, it's it's on the expensive side, but it's in scope. If we don't have the source art, we have to rebuild the thing from scratch, and then we that's the cost of a whole new weapon, uh, which was definitely out of scope. So yeah, that that was when we were lucky. Uh, we had the source art. Uh, an artist was able to quickly turn it around, and we were able to include it. So it's pretty exciting. All right, so moving away from, you know, kind of our, our live stream and article here, just some more general like sandbox questions and stuff like that. Let's take a moment to talk about deterministic recoil patterns versus the recoil direction stat. This is something that has been in the game for uh, a couple of seasons now. And, you know, it started really popping up on my radar with with a few different weapons and, you know, watching some reviews, um, you know, shout out to Cool Guy, always doing great in-depth reviews and the way that he would showcase the recoil patterns really brought that to the top of my mind of needing to focus on that when it comes to the fact that every weapon is really different now. Um, but it feels like these days there can be a bit of a disconnect on a weapon that says that it has, you know, a 64 recoil stat or, or something similar, and yet it feels incredibly stable uh, versus another that may have a, a, you know, recoil direction stat of 98, but has a much more difficult to control pattern. So um, how are you feeling about, you know, where deterministic recoil has landed? Is it is it like hitting its objectives? And how is that reconciled with recoil direction as a stat? Uh, yeah, I think um, Mercury's touched on this a little bit in the firing range podcast as well. Mm -hmm. So for like a more uh, PvP heavy explanation, you could uh, go and re-listen re -listen to that. Um, but yeah, so it's, we think that the system still has enough promise that we're going to persist with it. Uh, for the moment, it acknowledging that there is that 
like disconnects between how players treated the recoil direction stat previously and how they have to treat it on uh, weapons with deterministic recoil because the stat, like recoil direction stat, actually works the same way that it used to, except it's adjusting a different baseline. Mm -hmm. So it will still, like, at certain numbers, it pushes the recoil further to, to the right. Uh, at others, it pushes it further to the left. And at, um, like others, it, it's uh, not adjusting it uh, left or right at all. But if the um, deterministic recoil pattern is already pushing to the right and you have a recoil direction stat that goes to the right, it'll go even further to the right. And if it's mm. um, if the recoil direction stat would push to the left, then it will center it. So, um, yeah, like, it's it's not an ideal situation, <laughs> uh, but we think that it is, it is delivering on the goal of making each weapon feel more unique and uh, allow players to learn the recoil. I, I would like... Uh, for us to come and um, figure out a way to surface that information a bit more comprehensibly <laughs> to players. Yeah, because uh, just touching on one of our recent episodes on this show, uh, Saint, actually, you were firing much of the prophecy weapons because um, uh, Impetus and I we didn't have them, and normally we're, we're playing on uh, with mouse and keyboard anyway. So you're you're a resident controller player. But uh, just kind of referring back to that, saying uh, like you were fairly surprised about the sort of the recoil of actually firing the weapon versus the the recoil direction stat. Yeah, and and I've kind of found my own way around to what Chris is talking about. Of sometimes you end up with a pulse rifle, and the ideal recoil stat is like seventy seven or something like that, which is a, you know, and I, I think that a big part of that is it just goes against this like baked in mindset that's been there for so long of, um, you know, there's this balance between recoil direction and stability. Uh, if you want predictably vertical, you want a hundred. And now it, there's much more nuance to it. You know, you know, sometimes you want a, a, you know, sixties ish recoil stat. Sometimes the seventies is going to be better. Um, sometimes leaving it just, you know, exactly how it is. Um, even though it may not seem super high, um, you know, a weapon like relentless, uh, definitely comes to mind that our new, um, strand pulse rifle it is, it has a recoil set in the sixties and yet it, it, it's incredibly, easy to control recoil pattern in my experience of using it um but yeah it to your point of it definitely separates things even further you know going beyond uh looks sounds origin traits it does add yet another layer on you can't exactly predict that the same thing is just going to work on every weapon yeah it is uh it's probably worth noting that a higher recoil direction stat will still reduce the width of the pattern um it just won't change the direction in the way you might expect mm. all right cool well speaking of Merkulis on firing range uh, a few weeks back he stated chain reaction on specials as being brought down in power in the final shape to allow the trick to be introduced to other weapon types specifically he mentioned glaives it was all, it was a question about glaives which turned into chain reaction uh, so can you go into more specific details on how chain reaction is being changed uh, yeah, so um, we didn't drop all of the information earlier, but it's uh, less a nerf and more we're branching it. So uh, on special weapons, it will have a 15% smaller detonation radius and do 20% less damage. But on heavy weapons, it will have the same radius that it does now and do 30% more damage. So like a heavy GL mm -hmm. will be dramatically better at ad clear than a, a special GL, which is definitely not the case right now. But it will be in final shape. Very cool. And yeah, like and as Mercury said, like we can put this on all sorts of stuff now. Like uh, I really want to see it on a pellet shotgun. That'd be fun. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I, I want to see that too, actually. <laughs> That's a great yeah, idea. And also that uh man, that hullabaloo in my vault Ooh, looking pretty good right about now. Yeah, we originally built the perks so that we could have something like Firefly on weapons that weren't precision, <laughs> but it was way too strong on stuff that wasn't heavy at the time. But I, I think we could, uh, with this version, we could put it on non-precision special weapons. That definitely makes it more appealing on swords. Um, and I'm not saying that to oh, justify yeah. <laughs> my chain reaction cold steel slammer that's sitting in my vault right now. But yeah, that's good to hear. That's interesting. I like that. All right. Well, I guess speaking of... Um, 
perks that slow, Chill Clip was getting teased to uh, to be tweaked in the final shape art. Do you have any more specific details? Is this being changed across weapon types? Yes, no? Uh, yeah, we're, we are adjusting it. Um, so we're aware that the nerf didn't really affect it on the <laughs> the most powerful <laughs> weapon, i.e. Riptide. Uh, rapid fire fusion rifles, uh, but really hurt it on some other weapons. So the change is going to mean that uh, Riptide will require three shots to freeze, but slower firing fusion rifles will only require two. Um, and yeah, all other uh, all other archetypes have also been unnerved and will only require two shots to freeze. So it's just like the super rapid firing uh, weapons will require three. And then we'll we'll see. We, we might need to do some more adjustment later, uh, but the, that feels pretty good in playtesting anyway. Was Riptide on the list of weapons that uh, could have come back and into the light by any <laughs> chance? <laughs> uh, we didn't have any playlist weapons on that list. I think like it's 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 pretty meta, um, <laughs> yeah. But kind of, not in a really cool iconic way though. Like people don't <laughs> don't like make it part of their character's identity or anything like that. Like they've done with so many of the other weapons. My character's so, identity is I bypass all the champions with Riptide, actually. It's, uh, it's a really core part of my character's identity. <laughs> oh, you so, have a problem, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so just to really quickly clarify and just highlight, so the things like uh, grenade launchers, single firing uh, grenade launchers, and rocket launchers that have chill clip, they'll get unnerfed back to two shots. To, yep. uh Right. Oh, I knew I, 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 I knew it. I'm I'm so glad that that lingering dread with chill clip and ambitious assassin is still taking up a space. The vault cleaners, you know, they denied its value, but it's hanging on for yeah. another season. People have probably been wondering why I keep running bump in the night, but I know. <laughs> so we we've heard some rumblings of of some upcoming exotic changes. So we know that that some of our more underperforming exotic weapons um, are are going to be getting some some changes coming up. Um, we're you know we're thinking Queensbreaker, Colony, Truth, some some things like that. Um, are there is there anything you can tell us? Uh, any any new exotic changes upcoming for for you know later this season or in the final shape that you're really excited about reworks or anything like that? Uh, yeah, we have some changes coming in. Uh... Destiny 2 into the light, but I, I won't drop those now. Those, those are so soon. You can just wait a few weeks. Um, yeah, I can uh, drop some information on Queen Breaker, Truth, and Colony, at least. So Queen Breaker, like, it's already situationally pretty good, uh, like, in that it's a, it's just on-demand blind, which is really strong, and it's, it's actually it does pretty good damage. Uh, but anyway, we are increasing its damage versus bosses, mini-bosses, champions, and vehicles by 12% and increasing reserve ammunition by three, which uh, should put it uh, just past like the best legendary linear fusion rifles. So cost your exotic slot, but now you've got uh, a weapon that does good damage and also has on-demand blind. Uh, for truth, that had uh, like one major problem, which was that the grenades and horseshoes perk meant that it would only ever do AOE damage. And when you take impact damage away, that's a pretty big chunk gone. Uh, so we've increased the AOE damage to compensate. So it basically does full rock damage, um, but just entirely AOE. Uh, and also increased its reserves by three, which is on top mm. of the reserves change that high impact rocket launchers got. So mm. Wow. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, that's that's pretty juicy. Like that's a, a very large number of rockets and three in the mag, right? Uh, for colony, uh, the the patch note just says now spawns additional insectoid robots on final blows, but the way this works is on minor enemies like dregs or whatever, um, you kill one, it'll spawn an insectoid robot, uh, and there is there is a cooldown, so you can't just like kill a whole bunch of drakes with one explosion and spawn <laughs> 20 of them. But if you kill a tougher enemy, um, like a boss or something, it'll fall spawn five of them. Um, so you can potentially, <laughs> if you're killing large enemies, like just get colony robots just running everywhere, which is uh, hilarious. It's a pretty good time. That uh, That's beautiful. You know, I'll never forget this story I heard on an interview a long time ago about um, before the little insectoid robot existed, there 
was uh, <laughs> like the technology existed and they used like a, a rabbit or a frog or something as it's yeah oh man that's you know, honestly even too- scarier <laughs> You know, when you think about it, <laughs> a bunch of frogs coming out of an enemy. Yeah, we call that type of projectile a ground follow. Um, and we have like a, a bunch of abilities that spawn things that do that and uh, like colony robots. Uh, what else would you like to see converted into a ground follow projectile? Mm-hmm. I mean, it would be really funny to shoot a worm out of parasite and watch a worm spawn out of that and then slowly make its way. But like, and I really mean slowly for balance yeah, reasons, yeah. but also in theme, like really slowly make its way towards an enemy and then blow up again. That would be oh, awesome. Man. I wonder how slow we could make a ground floor projectile. <laughs> kind of want to try that now. <laughs> uh, man, I was going to say, you know, Queensbreaker also has the really cool intrinsic trait of making your teammates think that they're about to die when you're in a fallen theater. Yeah, can you yeah. change the sound uh, effect, man? Free, that is not you know? fun. Yeah. Well, not fun for what was it? I, I find it pretty fun. Okay. Was this, <laughs> see, this happens when we're okay. doing a PSYOPs Cosmodrone, and we're out in the open, oh, yeah. and I think that everything's dead, and then I just hear this wire rifle snap behind me, and I panic, and Court's like, what's the issue? I don't understand what's wrong with you. <laughs> The issue is I have no radar, and I thought I was about to get <laughs> obliterated by a sniper rifle court. That's the I'm issue. on a I'm on a podcast with a bunch of Queensbreaker haters. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, when we pray, when we played that prophecy run with uh, with yourself there, Chris, uh, you were uh, hyping up. So I I really appreciate that. Uh, with Queensbreaker, because it's obviously still got that kind of old classic selection between one uh, scope and the other is that staying put so we we have a we actually like we investigated putting that on a special reload uh which we think would be super cool like switching between those two scope modes uh we have a technical issue that prevents us from being able to swap which scope you've got uh when you're in actual gameplay we can Mm. do it uh, by allowing you to switch um like uh, talent nodes in the weapon inspection screen um I think like we are likely to get that tech at some point, at which point we will immediately do that to Queen Break. And and just real quick, so we we knew about Necrochasm and it's getting that one for thrall uh, trait. And just to confirm, that's also coming with the final shape. Ah, uh, yes, that's right. Okay. And I think the last one I'll, I'll ask on this, uh, you know, kind of exotic section is so we have Tessellation in the game. You know, it's been in there for a while for pre-order. Um, if if patterns would hold true, this will be getting some sort of catalyst in a couple months. Uh, what's that going to look like? Uh, yeah, so I can confirm that the tessellation catalyst is coming in final shape, uh, as you'd expect. Um, I can't reveal what it does. Um, you'll all find out fairly soon, actually. Uh, but it is going to be something subclass verb related. Mm, okay. Okay. It's frogs. It spawns frogs, but they're volatile. <laughs> they apply slow or scorch or jolt or yeah. Any any other catalyst teasers you want to put in here? Uh, no, I don't think there's anything else that I can talk about for catalysts. Okay, we tried. We tried. <laughs> so there's a few other things, uh, some traits that are in the game that are exhibiting some weird behavior that we were hoping to get a little bit of clarification on. Um, the first one here being bait and switch sometimes will proc on the first landed hit. Is that just a timing issue? Is there something else going on that you could shed some light on? Yeah, so there's a uh, kind of a networking race condition that can happen just on perks that give you a damage bonus that's triggered by something other than kills. <laughs> Mm. Like uh, when when you kill something over the network, that is super authoritative. It's very easy to make sure that 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 is applied at the correct time. Uh, but because of how uh, like some events are client authority are client authoritative, uh, it's difficult to ensure that those come in at the right time. So yeah, you'll sometimes see like the shot that Prox bait and switch might get the damage bonus very occasionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a similar issue on Dead Man's Tail a while back, uh, which is part of the reason why uh, we changed the design of the um, that damage bonus. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's something we've been able to work around in some cases, uh, and it's probably something we should fix on bait and switch. But uh, yeah, that's why that happens. Well, that's good to know. 
a bit more of a recent option here, uh, Cold Steel specifically on the Slammer, the Stasis Vortex Sword, is it supposed to be applying slow stacks every tick within a heavy attack, or is that supposed to proc once per the heavy attack? Uh, it is supposed to proc once per heavy attack, and to be honest, I'm not sure what it's doing in retail right now. Actually, um, just that. Actually, the slammer you, don't, you don't need to look at it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We can just uh, we can just move on. That to was that. a hypothetical question. <laughs> I think I think there's been some weirdness where it's either applying maybe not every tick of the heavy vortex attack. It's like once every couple ticks, or it's once per heavy attack completely, or it's not applying whatsoever. So I don't know oh, if really? there's maybe some sort of cooldown that's happening within that. We don't see that with Zephyr, which had Cold Steel way, way back, but, uh, uh, but yeah. And it's weird. Cold Steel trait seems fairly new to me, but yeah, that's coming up on like, two years ago, two and a half years. Yeah, yeah. I was compiling a list of, because uh, we got episode 100 coming up, and I was compiling a list of things that were in the game when episode one of the podcast came out, and no, one enough. of my things was, <laughs> uh, what were the, what were the seven stasis weapons that were in the game yeah. well spoiler alert zephyr was one of those original ones mm -hmm. so we've had cold steel since we first got our hands on legendary stasis weapons all the way back in season of the lost it just came out after the initial batch back in you know with the dawning so oh wow yeah all right so we have some more weapon subfamilies coming uh in game for the final shape do you want to go into some details with that uh, I would love to, but I can't. Um, I've got like, I think, Kay sitting with a sniper rifle somewhere near my house and <laughs> waiting for Carlos to give the word. Uh, but no, there's there's going to be some information coming relatively soon uh, on that stuff. So um, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, aside from the stuff that we already mentioned, like the, the support order rifle. Right? Okay, okay. What about more rocket sidearms? Uh, yeah, there are actually two of those in final shape. Um, one solo, one strand. And they're Ooh, both okay. extremely spicy. You can imagine some Man. of the perks that they can get. Yeah, they're a blast. <sighs> that's good. I can finally mix up and just stop only using indebted kindness in my loadouts. <laughs> you know, that's good. I'm sure Noah's thrilled, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, oh, those yeah. Uh, shipped in a really good state. We're, we're very, very pleased. So yeah, there was actually a reason why we showed that in the um, uh, the final shape uh like gear uh preview mm -hmm. thing right um but because at the time i thought that the last weapons release i would work on might end up being uh this current season that we're in i just decided to grab that for myself and implement it into a release that i was definitely still going to be on the weapons team for <laughs> um did the did the whole thing like yeah it's a big complex just, just one more up. thing before you go you know exactly yeah like Got so all on these a high note. weapon stats and like blast radius and projectile velocity. <laughs> this weird homing behavior. So yeah, so yeah, it was a fun last uh, weapon subfamily to do. I don't think I've ever used a Daggio so much on a weapon, which also like really struck me by surprise. But just the way mm. that it it works, uh, beacon rounds at Daggio just creates this like super hard hitting uh, tracking combination. Um, it's just a lot of fun to use. Yeah, it's a really good use case. But it, it fires so slowly to begin with that you don't actually super notice the adagio and you tend to yeah. pace your shots a bit. Yeah, it's nice. So kind of looking back at, at the Lightfall year, um, you know, what are the takeaways from Bungie adding more roguelike mechanics to our seasonal activities? Um, you know, we have the Arcana cards and the deep dive, you know, buff choices and Riven's, uh, you know, menu and the coil where you can spin wish glass um how are you guys feeling about all those kind of looking back in the year yeah so it's it's definitely not my area so i don't want to speak too much for the other teams but i do know there's a, a lot of excitement about those kinds of mechanics internally uh and like that there, there are likely to be more explorations of that type coming in future seasons good 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 um can you tell us anything about the playing card weapon set that we saw in the final shape trailer what's what's going on with that chris well, I can confirm that there is a whole set that looks like that. Uh, and yeah, you'll see more about those fairly soon as well. So you're, they're in the game, you're saying? They're definitely in the game. And okay. you've, you've seen, what, three six. of them? Six? Oh. There you go. There's yeah. at least six of them. 
Okay. Heard. <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> yep. All right. We have some more questions here before we kind of get to the fun section, I suppose. Uh, are there any traits that sounded straightforward on their design outline that ended up being massively difficult to actually implement or vice versa? Uh, yeah, I think um, Dawning Surprise was fairly complex to implement. <laughs> um <laughs> It's like there's there's a bunch of complexity around spawning a thing in the world and whether it spawns for everybody, uh, like one for everybody, or if it's just for the player who spawned it, or is there just one and someone can pick it up and then no one else can get it. Uh, so a lot of little weird edge cases like that. Um, and aside from like what happens when you run over it, like do we have a, a model that works for that? Um, so that was weirdly complex. Um, there are some with like weird race conditions as well, like you mentioned um, bait and switch earlier uh but that kind of uh networking issue has either made us pivot designs completely or spend a bunch of time to like catch all of the edge cases uh which is fairly expensive like you don't want to see hawk moon's setup that is just the most ridiculous <laughs> janky setup all designed so that you can't ever get the uh, damage bonus on the wrong shot <laughs> Or like mm. maintain it after you've fired or like do weird stuff with it. Like there's just a ton, a ton of checks. It's very, very complex. I imagine a lot of if else, if else, if else, if else, <laughs> if else. <laughs> yeah, I mean if only we had a, a programming programming language for that stuff, it would actually be easier. But yeah, like those those kind of structures in in the way we build weapons, like uh yeah, just covering all the bases. Yeah, it's surprising sometimes what sounds straightforward and is actually very complex. Um, and what sounds really complex, but is actually very easy. I think when you say, I, when you say well, go ahead, Court. No, off you go, Saint. I was going to say, when you say race condition, you, you're talking about the way that bait and switch is, is keeping track of the fact that there's like multiple timers going on for like hits that you're landing kind of a thing. Uh, yeah, it's like, does the, um, so like because of who arbitrates, like whether it's the client or the, um, the server that arbitrates dealing damage. And mm -hmm. like what state the perk is in on your client versus the state that it's on on the server. Uh, and if the, the timing timing for those is really tight. So sometimes uh, if you have a little bit of latency, um, those can not sync up quite right and you get things happening in the wrong order. Um, and it only happens with like very specific types of perks. Uh, but yeah, it's a, a pain in the ass when it does. I was thinking, <laughs> um, I suppose a fairly recent example just related to this question. I think you've mentioned uh, on previous shows, conditional finality was one of the kind of weird exotics to try and brute force because it's both <laughs> a stasis and a solar weapon. Yeah. Yeah, that had a bunch of um, like side effects with the uh, changes in, was it Lightfall to mm -hmm. um, like all of the armor mods caring about the damage type of the weapon that you had equipped. And a lot of those wouldn't behave correctly mm -hmm. Uh, unconditional finality and so we've had to, like introduce a bunch of extra steps to make sure that um damage switching exotics or like weapons with osmosis uh, or permeability on them behave correctly under those sorts of situations and just finally like w what about a perk you thought would maybe be really like, oh this sounds really difficult to try and implement but when you're actually going through the process it's like oh well, actually that was that was a piece of cake uh indomitability is actually a pretty good example there's like mm. The idea of checking what um, subclass you have equipped and then doing a different thing uh, based on that like sounded pretty complex, uh, but actually only took a couple of hours put together. Oh, actually, another another reason, another fun example. Uh, again, one of the the first perks I made, um, chain reaction, uh, which is what Beyond Light, I think. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Like okay, so we've got to figure out how Firefly or Dragonfly does its thing, and build that in a way that doesn't care about precision and it actually ended up being basically oh just spawn the dragonfly explosion and mm. then um <laughs> don't let it re-trigger off itself uh and that was yeah way 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 easier than it sounded like a lot of that uh like explosion related content uh, like shares data uh, I'm trying to remember what it even dropped on that first season so oh it was a rocket launcher yeah sub-zero salvo had that yeah was there anything else that launched right at Beyond Light that had chain reaction? Uh, the one of the playlist heavy grenade launches. I feel That's like right, the it. Gambit one. Yeah, the purple one. 
I actually chased that for a while. Ooh. All right. Well, we don't need to think about that at that time. Um, <laughs> we recently, well, I mean, maybe we do because we recently saw a substantial increase to grenade launcher reserves, heavy grenade launcher reserves, as well as many rocket launchers. How are you feeling about the current heavy sandbox? How those change, changes landed? Are there any future tweaks that are coming either with Into the Light or the Final Shape uh, on top of those, or are they sitting well? Uh, yeah, I think we're pretty happy with um, heavy weapon balance overall. Like, nothing is so dominant that it feels like you're throwing if you run something else, uh, which is, like, you know, speaks to we want everything to be viable, like, and for uh, legendary heavy weapons to be viable, um, for the most part, they have to be decent at DPS. Um, I do think that rockets are still a little bit spicy, uh, and we did just kind of, we didn't buff rockets overall, fortunately, but we, we did buff, bring up the, um, lower tiers. So I wouldn't, wouldn't be super surprised to see other stuff come up a bit or rockets come down a little bit. We actually have like a, a pretty sweeping set of changes to, um, PVE weapon balance coming in final shape a little bit early to talk about it yet, but you, yeah, you can definitely expect some meta changes. I know that you guys put out, and this is a long time ago, so if you don't quite remember everything, I don't blame you at all, but the roles for your heavy weapon families, um, the intended role is, oh, yeah. is single target versus add, clear, sustained versus burst damage. Is that still largely accurate, or have there been some changes since that initial um, article came out? And I think what's, what's really changed is we've... Uh pushed those weapons more into those intended roles because like when we first dropped that info i can't even remember the context like it was some twob um a million years ago right yeah um and so yeah like uh rocket launchers are like burst damage and secondary ad clear and like machine guns are ad clear and secondary um single target sustained damage like that kind of stuff i think has just become more true uh, and we haven't really mm. intentionally changed the roles uh, we, we had we had to be like pretty stubborn about machine guns like for for players to um actually start running them for for things like tough ad clear but like we're actually seeing that and it's it, they're, they're pretty pretty decent for uh single target damage that kind of thing um yeah, i think for the most part the the heavy weapon types are in a pretty good state like they could use a little bit of fine balance but i don't think uh, anything's straight garbage which wasn't true back then i don't think our last question here is kind of about upcoming sandbox changes which i know you mentioned we'll be hearing uh you know much more about in the near future so we can we just skip over those guys and go to a few uh, just a couple of a couple of more fun questions so all right off the bat what, favorite exotic weapon ornament huh uh Bit of a toss up. I, I really like. I'm just going to look at weapons that I I um, personally did design work on. <laughs> Choose wisely because like Reddit is going to crucify you for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah, well, yeah. we'll allow you to kind of look at your uh, your selection. We'll do yeah. a little round table. I'll kick us off with uh, Monte Carlo's <laughs> Dreaming Clary, which is the uh, Deepstone Crypt. Oh, okay. yeah. oh yeah, that one's great. And the um, that landing. Uh, so close to us doing the Monte Carlo catalyst. Yes. <laughs> uh, it was just, that was so good. And like the, uh, we were able to get, uh, like VFX did a treatment so you could see the blade glowing when you had the perk up on all of the ornaments. Like yep. uh, that was just, it was beautiful. It's gorgeous. Beautiful timing. I think for my favorite uh, ornament, it's probably the 30th anniversary Dead Man's Tail ornament. Uh, the one which is like a, a molita- uh, modern military um mm. action, but like the oh that's got the great the scope yeah sights. yeah yeah that one's great. yeah the iron mm-hmm. sights yeah i'm really fond of the dreaming city forerunner ornament as well um that one's beautiful or actually the uh the traveler's chosen dreaming city ornament as well like i don't know if you've seen seen that one but it's got like this custom treatment for the um the reticle that shows the number of stacks that you've got of gathering light and it's all like dreaming city themed yeah, yeah. i I think I may say, I want to say it's Dreamcatcher is a Yotun ornament that also changes the scope. It changes into a yeah. circle and it has this effect where it rotates around in like a 180 before the shot will fire. Kind of like you're saying, it adds this, you know, just like a little bit of a unique layer onto the yeah. firing effect, which is really cool. I love that. That and, uh, 
I can't remember the name of it, but it's the one that makes Borealis. It gives it a very sleek shape to it. Um, also, just like incredibly good looking, like sci fi weapon design, you know? Man, there's some good ones. I don't know what I would pick here. Oh, I do know what I'm going to pick. Yeah. Uh, in Finality, that's the collective obligation ornament. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, the yeah. rock yeah. on top of the metal gun frame. That yeah. hits for me, man. I, I don't know what it is, but that, that does it for me. That's You want to talk about exotic? Man, yeah, it looks exotic. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have a uh, favorite sound design for a weapon you have worked on, Chris. And any time a designer really surprised you with their work? Uh, yeah, fa- favorite sound design probably Ostio Strigo, just because mm. the the concept for the like the design for the weapon came first, and we had like the name of the perk. Um, Screaming Swarm. I think that actually was the shipping name, um, shipping name for the perk. And sort of talking to the sound designer about how I had this vision for it's like sending a stream of like corrupted insects at at a target, and it'd be really great if like you could like hear them wailing as they went towards the enemy. And the sound designer went pretty subtle with it, but like if you lean on that trigger, the weapon just starts to scream faintly um, as you get towards the mm. bottom of the magazine. Um, so yeah, like the, the experience of, uh, that process working with audio was really cool. The most surprising one was, uh, on Dead Man's Tale, uh, like same sound designer who worked on Hawkmoon and like for Hawkmoon, I, I'd said, it's important that we have a really clear tell, uh, for the whole like PVP map that someone's got a, a one shot round loaded in Hawkmoon. Um, and <laughs> watch so, like, out. <laughs> yeah. The, so you have the, um, you know. I mean, he calls it the caca, but like the, the hawk cry mm-hmm. thing, which is cool. And same designer working with Deadman Sound said, you know, we should have a tell for like when you've got five sacks of that. It's not a one shot, but it's still pretty dangerous. And uh, like the story goes, I, I didn't know that he was doing this. So I just, it, I saw it and heard it in a playtest and it was hilarious, but it does like that um, cowboy whistle when you've got five stacks mm-hmm. of yeah. spike. <laughs> uh, and this was like right after we'd um, switched to work from home. Um and apparently just, like, recorded that in, like, the bathroom in his house or something. And that was the <laughs> audio that ended up shipping. <laughs> so it's got that got that resonance. And, yeah, that, that was a great surprise in a playtest. That actually reminds me, uh, it was a couple of days ago, and I think Impetus Saint and I were just in a voice chat and we're just doing some Grandmasters. And it was, I had Deathbringer in the inspect screen. I was just, like, looking at Deathbringer. And it's got that, like, like that noise I, I don't know how to describe it but i must have had like the music turned off i was like well, where's this noise coming <laughs> from it it's like a hive a... scream or something yeah, like a grinding very, scream very strange noise <laughs> yeah there are some like wild easter eggs uh, in some of the exotic weapons that um unless you have music off and you're looking at it in a quiet environment um you just will never notice that's cool stuff all right there's no doubt that you guys are, of course, inspired by other franchises and media for your work, just as regular artists are inspired by other artists. Is there one weapon that you could lift out of another franchise and destinyify it? Uh, what would that be if you could? Mm. So the problem is we've already done this a bunch of times. <laughs> uh, like... Um, Rocket pistols are pretty clearly inspired. Like, they're real-world rocket pistols, right? So, like, gyrojet pistols or whatever. But, um, like, there are rocket pistols in, a, a like, a pretty fun uh, sci-fi franchise that I won't name, um, which, like, always wanted to put one of those in Destiny. Uh, or, like, Tiku's Divination was, what if Legolas had a magic solar bow? Um, <laughs> kind of thing, like, a, a few fun things like that. Uh, for me, like, I'd, I'd probably go to something really silly and do the um, fully automatic crossbow from the Van Helsing thing, which just, like, <laughs> fires this ridiculous stream of crossbow bolts um, all over the place. Like, that'd be good fun. Shout out to Hugh Jackman, man. He gets yeah. all the good weapons. <laughs> mm. a- am I picking up a 40k vibe with a rocket pistol? A bolter, maybe? They can't talk about it, Sane. It's Okay, you know, sure. So, wink and sure. a nod, right? Okay, fair. So, you know, one last one for you. 
you know, what, what are you playing right now? What, what, you know, what games are you playing? What are you, what are you enjoying right now outside of Destiny? You know, Destiny's fun. It's also work. What else are you playing? Uh, I'm like 150 hours into Helldivers 2, I think. Uh, that is an amazing game. I was a huge fan of the first game as well. Like everything that Arrowhead has done. Um, like, yeah, they, they just knocked it out of the park. I don't even know how you go from a something like a really good top down like but fairly low fidelity game into like this massive triple a expansive uh experience which is just like uh set gaming on fire this year super super good um other than that i just started playing dragon's dogma 2 um which is a good time uh, i liked the first one a lot something about like climbing all over a, a griffin that then takes off and you're like stabbing it while it's flying away like all those sorts of moments pretty good fun <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like Shadow of the Colossus on like a slightly smaller scale, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. If Shadow of the Colossus had like RPG progression and felt like a um like a homebrew D and D game or something. Yeah. I'm playing through Cyberpunk as well. Um I like almost got to the end and then I started playing the DLC. So now I'm like half in the DLC. Yeah, man. And you talk about some wild weapons. There's some wild stuff in uh, Cyberpunk too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, really uh, really clever weapon design as well. Like, I think uh, that's some of the, the best, um, like, gun feel um, mm. that we see in non-Bungie games. I was going to say, that's saying a lot coming from some of the Bungie <laughs> weapon designer, you know, yeah. talking about gun feel. Yeah, they're really good. I feel really grounded, and so, which is surprising for something that feels so sci-fi, but, like, they, they feel like they can be real objects, which is, yeah, high praise. All right. Well, before we wrap things up here, do you have any questions for us or for the community? Oh, man. Yeah, I always do. Uh, what are you all planning on running for uh, day one Final Shape raid? Ooh. Mm. Okay. See, this is tough because I don't know what that sandbox article in uh, an indeterminate <laughs> near future time period is going to say, but... Yeah. To, uh, to I, quote a bunch of dev, Solar Warlock is what I'll be running. <laughs> okay. I think it has to be Void Hunter for me. I am, am, I kind of do two modes. I, I'm either like, you know, thinking team survivability when it comes to day one, or I'm thinking how can I put out as absolutely much damage as possible right now? Um, team survivability wise, I used to say Phoenix Cradle because I think the ability to just give restoration to everyone on the field at the same time is incredibly strong these days um precious scars is pretty good for team survivability if you have a pretty high potency loadout uh you're you know you're shredding with the machine gun something like that um but damage wise it's got to either be pyro gale if i want to burst down some beefy targets or um you know, Worm Gods, one, two punch, Ikelos V3, <laughs> you know, Strand Titan is is still doing some some crazy things. Yeah, for survivability, you should definitely try the uh support rod rifle. Uh that thing that can keep thing can carry a bit. Okay. Okay, day one, final shave, reload out, support auto <laughs> rifle. You heard it here first, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, um, Thanks for the time. It's been a long day for you. I know, uh, you know, doing, doing interview, doing live stream. So we really appreciate you coming by uh, PVE to just talk about the game that we all love. Yeah. Always a pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll see you uh, for some, some onslaught rounds, <laughs> some yeah. 50 wave mm -hmm. completions on legend difficulty. Yeah. If you have any questions after the next round of information drops, uh, definitely reach out. Yeah, look forward to your uh, uh, your new position, all the spiciness that you're you're all going to be cooking up for the future. That's it for a very special episode. We want to thank Chris Proctor again for joining us, and of course Bungie for the great opportunity and a peek into the development process. We also want to thank our audio engineer Autodidactos for editing this episode, helping us all sound our best, and getting the editing out so quickly. Next episode is our 100th. Please join us as we take a look back at some of our favorite PvE activities and moments over the years. My name is Sink Beer. You can find me by that name on social media in the Massive Breakdowns Discord server. Court, where can our listeners find you? 
Yeah, I can't wait for that episode, Saint. It's going to be uh, some brewskis with the broskis. Uh, yeah, you can find me over on various social platforms and Discord as Court Projects. You can find my spreadsheets and various other documentation and apps to enhance your Destiny experience over on the Destiny Science link tree. And you can also find me in game searching for some really interesting uh, Into the Light roles uh, in a few weeks' time. Impetus, where can we find you? My name is Impetus. You can find me by that name in Discord and in Destiny, where I will be putting together some builds for Onslaught so that I can do that Legend difficulty and get those rare double drops on the special limited edition variants of these special, special weapons from across Destiny. That's it for this week. We will see you later. Have a good one. Get ready for Onslaught. Into the Light. It's coming. Prepare yourselves.